weren't recording any of that? Oh, no, I figured, you know, start it. <laughs> well, okay. the recipes maybe at the end, or we can share. Yeah, yeah that's the texture, Josh. The, the texture. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Let's see how this goes. All right. All right, can everybody see that? Uh, yeah, but you want you can also go to a cool. different window where you won't see. We're seeing that. There you go. Now you uh, yeah. Got it. Good. Yep. All right. Cool. Excellent. All right, guys. So welcome. So this is going to be the part two to the algae lecture. You might see some slides that we saw last week. And just to kind of reiterate exactly what Kim said, you don't need to know really any of this to grow your own oysters. This is kind of a little bit more in depth then, you know, if you're just interested in getting your oysters and growing them and then, you know, just taking them home, this is going to be a little bit in depth, but it relates at the same time because we're going to be talking about what your little oysters are eating and what they're growing on. Um, and also, um, every single oyster that you are growing started its life out in a hatchery. So we'll get a little bit of a glimpse of what that looks like. So without further ado, let's begin. So we saw this slide last week, but just to kind of reiterate, reiterate what Kim said. Um, so what exactly is a microalgae? And, you know, when we hear of an algae, you know, you kind of think of a plant, but like Kim said last week, they're not a plant at all. So what defines a plant is having, you know, a root system, and then there's something that takes the water called a xylem and, and something else that delivers the food called a phloem. That doesn't exist um, in algae, nor does it um, exist in seaweed. So seaweeds, they kind of get all their nutrients from the leaves. Algae, the microalgae we talk about are all little individual cells. Um, so to kind of go off at a little bit further, these um, definitions were um, taken from, um, there's a gentleman named Gary Wickford. He's one of the top um, scientists from NOAA. He's kind of like an algae and oyster guru in a sense on the research side of things. Um, but he used these definitions in the presentation he gave and I absolutely love it because you get like a simple, a complex and a super complex one. So when you think of microalgae, you know, little tiny little seaweeds. Um, and I like the phytoplankton because it gives kind of the Greek origin, which means light wanderer. So when we think of algae, you know, we kind of think of something that's, I don't know, grown on the side of your house or those who have pools, you know, um, you know, they'll be grown in your pool. But, you know, these organisms are actually very so much so alive. And when you look at them under the microscope, there are some, you know, species and strains that actually move. Um, so to kind of go on the definition of them, they're single-celled or colonial photosynthetic organisms. So they could be either found, you know, individually or in colonies. And kind of going forward to, this might be a lot, and especially um, a lot of you, I'm sure, are not familiar with this. So if there's any confusion or anything, you know, feel free to raise your hand, do something with the chat bar, um, you know, unmute yourself and say something. Um, this is going to be super interactive. I'm going to try to keep it as casual as possible and not get too, too in depth. So like I said, if there's any confusion, please, please, please feel free to ask any questions. Um, so where can you find microalgae? And in fact, it's kind of everywhere. So when you're trying to culture it and grow the little buggers, um, contamination can come, you know, everywhere. And what's kind of in, in you know, the Arctic, um, there's also, you know, microalgae that, you know, stains the snow red. Um, so you literally can find it everywhere. Um, what's kind of really cool, and again, taken from one of Gary's lectures, there is um, a professor, I don't remember off the top of my head which college this is from, but as a part of his lecture, he has a shoe box that he's kept for years full of dirt. And years after year, they have, he has his students take a little spoonful of dirt, put it into some, you know, water with some fertilizer in it, and year after year, there goes a microalgae bloom off of that dirt. So when we think of it, it's pretty much everywhere. And as Kim says, you know, said last week, algae is eternal. And that is so very much true. Um, so the actual form of what these little buggers look like, um, they could be really simple or really complex. And all that has to do with how they intake the nutrients. So I like this picture because it shows a whole wide variety of what these guys look like. And if you look, there's all these, all these little shapes. Um, I just want to make sure really quick that we are recording. Um, and I think we should be, but I'm just going to stop the screen share for a second. Pause share. 
You are. I can see it in the top right. Okay. Yep. Well, perfect. All right, excellent. I'm going to resume it just to make sure. All right, cool. Excellent. So going back, you know, you either be really simple, tiny little dots, or look, I mean, I like that one in the bottom right. It kind of, it kind of almost looks like what like kind of COVID looks like a little bit, a little spiky and everything. So kind of relatable, but you know, they're, you wouldn't think these things are so complex, but they kind of are. Um, and of course they have different colors. You have reds, browns, greens, blue greens. And why is this? Is so since they are almost like plants and they're doing the same, the same way that plants get food through the process of photosynthesis, algae is doing the same thing with a couple exceptions, but for the most part, they're mostly performing photosynthesis. So the different colors is just the different interactions and in, on how the cell is gonna get food. So going forward, you, there's a whole list of things. And what I kind of wanted to highlight um, with this is, so the chlorophytes, which, you know, kind of my favorite because they're green and they actually look like what algae should look like instead of like all these browns and everything, but all the trees and everything that we see all originated from these algae cells pretty much. So the like if you start, you know, from way, 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 millions, millions, millions of years ago, all of our trees and all of our plants originated from this. Um, the other thing I have highlighted here are cryptophytes and it's another strain of red algae. And so when we think of red algae and red tides, um, we automatically go to something that's toxic, but it might not always be the case. It's all dependent on the strain of algae. And, you know, there are so, 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 so many different strains of algae. And it's so diverse that unless you can actually key out what you're looking at, color is kind of the worst way um, to look at algae. Um, those who love fish and I love fishing because, you know, I'm obsessed with it, you know, and in going through like fish taxonomy, coloration um, in relation to a fish is kind of the worst way to identify. Kind of the same thing with algae. Um, and I, you know, I figured kind of these little guys um, would get, get their own slides. So the dinoflagellates are what we consider to be, you know, the more, they're generally the more toxic strain of algae. Um, so the red tides, the brown tides, the mahogany tides, everything like that is mostly a dinoflagellate. And these guys are, in my opinion, unbelievable because they're, they kind of grow and divide a lot slower than most other algae strains. And how microalgae, kind of getting back to it, how it grows, instead of getting big and tall like you and I would or like a plant does, they just they, they undergo mitosis. So one cell is turning into two and then that's dividing and dividing and dividing. So when we measure and determine, you know, algae biomass, instead of like height and how large something is, it's how dense the population is. So when, you know, when it comes to algae, you kind of think of them as, you know, a population rather than a single organism. Kind of reminds you of ants, right? Like when you think of an ant, it's a colony as opposed to, you know, the single person or the single, you know, the single ant. Kind of the same deal. So when with the dinoflagellates, because they grow a lot slower, competition exists everywhere. So they needed to develop, you know, a survival strategy in order to survive against the vast array of other algae species out there. So what's kind of crazy is um, some dinoflagellate strains developed, and this kind of goes back to red tide and brown tide evolutionary strategies um, that will either, you know, kill their competition or inhibit the predators. So we can, you know, use brown tide as a really, you know, really good example of this. So the reason why brown tide kind of, and that, that's Areococcus, um, the reason why that kind of takes over is there's something that the actual algae cell gives off that it inhibits other algae strains around it to grow. And because that happens, they're able to intake all the delicious nutrients that everything else would. And now when it comes to them blooming up and everything, as the shellfish intake them, um, they get into such high densities and such high volume that it clogs, you know, the gills of the shellfish, you know, that are around in the area. So it inhibits feeding. So kind of amazing, right? When you think of something that small, you wouldn't think of something that like, you know, has competition like that or isn't able to inhibit competition like that, but it's very much so. Um, the other kind of example, and I'll get to in the next slide. Um, so when we also go back to an algae cell, you know, I mean, and what Kim talked about as a protist, they're not a plant nor an animal cell. They're kind of like this weird standalone in between sort of thing. But the dinoflagellates are a little bit more animal, animal cell like than they are plant like. And the best example I can think 
of is Prorocentrum, um, which is a nasty little bugger when ingested by shellfish. But on its own, it's not really toxic. The, re the, the way that it becomes toxic is when conditions um, allow it or not allow photosynthesis, photosynthesis to happen, that algae cell is actually able to eat bacteria. And the byproduct from that bacteria ingestion is actually what makes it toxic. Um, the other kind of bad thing, and when I think of algae and look at algae, I kind of think of it as, oh, what can I feed this to? Or what, what shellfish can I feed this to? Um, nutritionally, um, the dinoflagellates are actually amazing, but because they're, you know, inhibitors pretty much, they're not really good shellfish food because, you know, they either kill the shellfish or are trying to eat it or are harmful to you. Um, but, you know, nutritionally, they're amazing, which is kind of mind blowing in my head. So here's all the different pictures as Kim showed on the last um, presentation of just kind of what these nasty little buggers look like and kind of going back to form and function, they're rather complex and not just simple little dots. So how does this, again, how does this relate to your oysters? Again, it's your food. So the better plankton or better, you know, algae content you have in the waters and in the creeks or wherever you're trying to go grow your oysters, the happier your oysters are going to be. And let's be honest, you know, happy oysters equates to happy people, happy parties, happy everything. So ha happy oysters, you know, when it comes to this, you just eat everything. And also happy oysters mean they're going to be filtering, they're going to be spawning more oysters, they're going to be doing the little oyster thing. And, uh, you know, some stat members might recognize the happy oyster company. Um, those who know BART, that's, you know, I figured that, you know, fit really, really well. Um, so when we talk about microalgae and everything, especially at Cornell, um, you know, in addition to the environment that it's in, um, there is a very heavy, of course, aquaculture basis, of course, of the entire program, right, is learning how to grow your own oysters. And, you know, going forward, um, what's even more exciting is this FAT program has its own algae lab now. So the kind of cool thing about this is when you walk into, you know, the algae lab, instead of looking like a mad scientist experiment, you know, you'll be able to have some familiar, familiar, yeah, familiarity with it. Of course, I can't pronounce words tonight, but, you know, it's fine. It's fine. It's all good. Um, so, you know, as we're going through with aquaculture, um, you know, because everything is so controlled, um, it's not like when I'm trying to grow or you're trying to grow oysters when they're really, really small. It's not like you can just take a bunch of seawater and throw it in your tanks. Um, the animals and oysters, when they're first grown, are really, really, really small. And because if you throw unfiltered seawater into a tank with marble oysters, there are a bunch of other things that are going to want to eat your oysters. So in order to combat against that, um, everything in a hatchery and everything is all filtered. So when you filter your water extensively, you're also filtering out all the algae that are naturally found in the water. And also with that being said, and kind of when going back, not all algae is good for um, shellfish. Um, even more interestingly enough, um, shellfish, you know, the shellfish that you're growing, if there's a really good algae community out there, um, there's always gonna be kind of a dominant strain. And what's kind of even crazier is that dominant strain kind of flip flops with something else roughly every three to five days. So your algae concentration um, throughout you know, the year is kind of gonna change. And also going back to something what Kim said last week in August, and you know, you go down to the docks and in August you notice your water is crystal clear. Kim said he's gonna kick you in the water. Yeah, I mean, of course he is because you know, if the water is crystal clear, there's not a lot of, lot, not a lot of algae um, that's in there, but all the algae is not gone, gone. Um, so with that being said, going back to um, microalgae and aquaculture, um, there's kind of an industry standard set of strains that people use. So when you go into the spat lab, um, you might notice, you know, something's labeled ISO or tetrasomus or pavlova. These are all different algae strains throughout years and years and years of experimentation um, that are used to pretty much optimize shellfish growth. And that goes based on the nutritional um, quantity, nutri nutritional content of quantity, but nutritional content of the algae cells themselves. So just like you and I have baby food and adult food, we're kind of looking at the same thing when it comes to raising shellfish. You have baby food and adult food. 
So to kind of go off of that and all the different pretty colors, most of the algae that we grow in the shellfish hatchery are browns. And that's just kind of just, you know, the biology of it. Um, so I don't expect anybody to remember any of these names, um, but just kind of keep in mind baby food versus adult, adult food. Um, and because they're a plant and if you're trying to grow them, you know, in pretty much an artificial environment, there are a lot of, you know, things you have to consider. So you need to have a light source, you need to have a fertilizer, um, because, you know, they require CO2 for food. You got to figure out a way that you're going to get CO2 in there. And of course, the strains that you desire, the equipment and protocol is everything. So as we kind of talked about before, um, you know, these buggers are really, really small. And to kind of put it in perspective um, of how small these algae strains are, when a clam and oyster um, are first born, um, they're roughly 40 microns. And one micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter. And there's kind of this little general rule that a shellfish larvae can only ingest something that's one tenth of their size. So if something's 40 microns, then you have to feed something that's four microns. And that's really, 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 really small. Um, and kind of also going back to it is um, you're trying to grow the basis of the food chain. So if anything that's unfiltered gets in your algae culture, it's going to have a heyday because it's, you're, you're, you're pretty much growing like a buffet of things that it's just going to go absolutely haywire over. So let's say you have a bag of something or a container or a tank of something that's brown and then you come in the next day and it's green, really pretty, really cool. However, it might not be something that you're going to be able to give to your shellfish when they're baby. When they're adults, it doesn't really matter. They'll eat everything. <laughs> um, so kind of going forward, this is just kind of a little more specifics on, you know, what the algae um, that we're trying to grow requires. Um, kind of, you know, going back and again, going a little bit backwards because I'm getting a little bit of ahead of myself. Um, so when we're growing algae in a hatchery and kind of going back to good algae and bad algae, um, all the algae strains that we grow in a hatchery setting and that what spat's growing and everything is all good algae. And what Kim kind of mentioned last week is not all of it necessarily is you know, native to our waters. However, you can't prove that it's not not native. And let's say, you know, you indict, you dump, I don't know, 500 gallons of the good algae that you grow into the creek or into the conic bay. It's not going to be a problem because that the cells are so delicious that they're going to be eaten by something else immediately. And we see this in high density cultures. So, I have, you know, a culture that's super black or super dark and, you know, something is in it, you'll come in the next day and your culture will be crystal clear. And then you look at it underneath the microscope and you see all little buggers and all little stuff swimming around. So even if it naturally get, you know, even if it somehow gets into the water, something microscopic is going to eat it or the oysters you're growing might eat it too. And they're going to be maybe even happier than they normally would be um, eating the algae out of the creek. Um, so, um, that being said, because everything is so small and also so sensitive, you have to be really clean with everything. Um, and we'll kind of get in, um, get into that. I have um, exanic cultures um, underlined because it's a very interesting. So when we talk about something that's exanic, um, it's pure. And when you're trying to grow these algae strains, you're dealing with pretty much pure cultures. But that is, you know, the word exanic is kind of iffy, iffy, iffy because you can pretty much determine something's bacteria free, but you can't guarantee something's, you know, free of viruses. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, if you talk to kind of, you know, the research scientists about that, they'll be like, well, it's bacteria free, but I don't know if I can call it azanic. But in shellfish culture, we look at it under a basic microscope. If we just see algae cells moving around, that's good enough for us, so. Um, so when you're trying to grow everything, um, this is kind of just a little graph of kind of what goes on. And I kind of like, because I'm a fish nut, I kind of like to describe it um, as, you know, introducing a new fish into a fish tank. So, you know, you have an algae culture, you have water, that's going to be your culture media, and you pretty much throw your algae in there. It's a new tank, you put a fish into a new fish tank, it's kind of like, well, man, what's going on? I don't know, you know this environment's new, so I'm going to be a little stressed out. The algae kind of does the same thing. So you throw it into a new tank, and it might not necessarily grow for a day or two days. Um, but as it gets used to its environment, and as your fish 
you know, gets used to his fish tank is going to come out of hiding. It might come out of a little cave or plants or stuff that you um, go in there. So as your algae gets more comfortable in its container, it's going to start growing. But because you're growing something in a tank, it's only going to be able to grow so much. So as it's growing and it's really growing quick, we call that exponential growth. But when it hits that top of that curve, it stops. And because it stops, that's called um, stationary phase. And then, you know, it's going to survive. It's going to do its algae thing for a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And then eventually, because this is algae's favorite thing to do, it's going to die. And when that happens, okay, I'm going to start over. Um, and that die off is obviously called, you know, the death phase. Um, anybody have any questions on anything so far? I know this is kind of a lot. Um, if nobody unmutes in a second, then I'm just going to keep on continuing. <laughs> just everybody, everybody pay attention, because I'm sure he's going to get to it, where mm -hmm. the arrow is looking at the peak of log phase or exponential phase growth. Ooh. So because I'm not sure that, that is, because yeah. that little spot there is going to come into play with stuff that he's talking about later. Can everybody see my cursor or no? Can you see? Yes. Yes. Okay. So when we talk about you know, algae in a hatchery, it's all about shellfish nutrition. And like I said, when I think of algae, it's how can I, you know, give this to my shellfish? So when it comes to shellfish nutrition, the most nutritious the cells are going to be is at that little, little tip right there. So when you're growing your algae, if you can keep everything kind of in between exponential growth and stationary, it's like the best diet you can give your animals. And, um, and the reason, there's kind of a little more complicated reason behind that. But when you get into stationary, the, the nutritional value kind of just goes down. The cells get like, I don't want to use the term older, but it gets more stale at that point. And the nutritional value of that cell actually changes. Um, and the kind of interesting stuff, interesting stuff about, you know, shellfish, a lot of it's all about the omega-3 fatty acids. So just like you and I need omega-3s to make us, you know, big and strong and everything, shellfish kind of need the same thing. And what's kind of really interesting in, you know, oysters, particularly as larvae, um, you know, when we eat food and especially, you know, unsaturated fats, uh, we make cholesterol out of it, right? Um, and our bodies can naturally produce cholesterol, um, but shellfish larvae can't. And there's an evolutionary kind of aspect of that in which, you know, there's such a vast community of algae naturally found in the water. Evolution was like, hey, I can get the cholesterol from the natural environment. So why do I have to exert energy, you know, making my own cholesterol? So in a hatchery, because we're, you know, filtering, filtering out the natural phytoplankton concentration, we have to feed cells that fulfill that cholesterol requirement. Um, and so in shellfish larvae in development, I'm sure, you know, as the larvae lectures and everything kind of continue, Kim will get into that. Um, it's kind of really important that you give your shellfish a really balanced diet. So when they're going from a larvae to an oyster that you and I know and love, um, they'll be able to do so successfully. Um, but yeah, like I said, and like Kim brought up, that little peak right there is when you're harvesting algae is when you want to harvest everything appropriately. You and also have, right at that point the fastest doubling rate and yeah. and so it's super healthy and theoretically if you can hold it at that level josh already said it in a perfect world you could do that eternally yeah but we're not in a perfect world so thanks <laughs> and, we, and it was kind of even more amazing to think about it because you know um algae when it's dividing it's pretty much the same exact cell as the cell before so when you really think about it, that strains of algae we have could be potentially, you know, originally millions of years old. So you're dealing with the most archaic, simple organism that is found on our entire planet, which I don't know, I think is pretty amazing and also humbling at the same time. Um, so there's a large, large variety of methods that you can culture algae. And, you know, there's kind of a funny story that I want to explain as we get into it. So you have pretty much, you know, I'm going to label it down to two methods. You have the Wells Glancy method, which as Kim talked about last week, was just you throw your animals out in the natural water and they're going to eat or, you know, you're, they're going to eat whatever, whatever it is out there, which can either be a good thing if you have a good phytoplankton community or a bad thing if you have, you know, bad algae that's out there. Um, as 
shellfish aquaculture throughout the years became more refined and more popular. And, you know, people were just like, hey, we really need to figure this out and find the best possible diet. Um, the Milford method from the Milford labs and um, the NOAA labs in uh, Connecticut was developed. I believe it was in the 50s, the Milford, right, Kim? I, I believe so. It was in the 50s, the Milford method really started to hash out. Um, yeah, it was it was Gouillard and, and Lusanoff and these yeah. really uh, iconic figures that, that were, you know, just just coming up with it in the in yeah. the late 40s, early 50s. And, and it's revolutionary because even, you know, today it's the same methods that we use to culture phytoplankton in the hatchery. And it's just a more specific way, again, to control every single aspect um, in the hatchery. Um, in order to be successful, you have to have control pretty much over, you know, every single part. Um, so, and that continuous culture method kind of falls back to the Milford method. It also can kind of fall back to the Wells Glancy, depending on what you're doing. Um, but kind of going with the Wells Glancy, so it relies on natural blooms. And like I said, it's not really ideal because not all algae are, are created equal. Um, but there's a funny story I kind of want to tell uh, really back in the day before regulation was really a thing. And there was um, a shellfish production production facility um, way, way back in the day that used tidal ponds in order to grow their shellfish. They had their animals kind of, you know, down current of where their tidal ponds were. And they would block the tidal ponds up and throw a bunch of nitrogen in there. Oh my God, could you imagine trying to throw a bunch of fertilizer in the natural seawaters today? <laughs> this this was done right down the road from the Marine Center at the at the Plock facility, which was Shelter Island. When, when we yep. discovered in the back of his, his system were bags of fertilizer, it was really mind blowing, like Josh said. Oh, hi, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Abby, I have a question for you guys. Yeah. So some of the natural aquifers on Long Island, like lakes and things of that nature, would those be habitable for freshwater oysters? Uh, yes. Um, so um, are you familiar with uh, South Old at all? Yes. Yeah. So do you know Great Pond? Yes. Yeah. So that actually has freshwater clams in it, believe it or not, and freshwater mussels. Um, Interesting. Which is amazing. There's a couple other little creeks and stuff around here that had a freshwater clam population, which is unbelievable. I mean, going back to it, so I have, I'm a lake house on a lake in the Catskill Mountains and the water clarity is unbelievable. But there's also an amazing um, freshwater mussel population up there. And what's kind of even more interesting is the freshwater mussel species for the most part are protected. Um, so it's not like you could go into Great Pond or whatever and you know harvest mussels from there or clams from there to eat. Um, but it's the sign of a really, really, really healthy ecosystem when you have those guys in there. Um, there's also, you know, problems in the Great Lakes with the zebra and quagga mussels that are out competing the, you know, natural, you know, um, freshwater clams and mussels up there, but that's a whole separate issue in and of itself. Um, but, but yeah, so pretty amazing when you think about it, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so like as Kim said, um, yeah, so pretty, yeah, so they would rely, you know, on natural phytoplankton bloom, you know, based from nitrogen fertilizer, and then they would, like Kim said, would pretty much let the floodgates open, let all the natural algae flow and all their little oysters would eat it. And, you know, it worked, but was it good for the environment? No, <laughs> but hey, we didn't, you know, who would have thought, I guess, back in the day, right? But it is what it is. <laughs> um, but kind of going on the Milford method, like I said, it's, you know, more of a controlled method and you're growing very specific strains of algae, ideal for shellfish culturing. Um, so, like I said, but that why question was already answered. So with the Milford method, it's you know not as simple as oh I'm gonna have a big tank and I'm just gonna throw a little bit of algae in it and it's gonna do its thing. You kind of can't really do that. So you have to kind of start off you know small and kind of work your way. So a lot of hatcheries they can get their initial starter algae from a bunch of different avenues. Um, the Milford Labs um, the, in Connecticut. Um, is an avenue that people can contact and they have a collection that's been going for years upon years upon years that you can get cultures of algae. You can also buy cultures of algae from companies, um, but the algae cultures from the companies are really expensive. But, you know, but you're getting really high quality algae. So if you're a hatcher just starting out, it's a worthwhile investment because you really can't have a shellfish hatchery. You, you can't really have shellfish without algae. It, it all starts with algae. And it's, you know, 
in terms of culture and shellfish, it's kind of the most difficult thing um, that you're going to be able that that's going to happen. Um, so you get little tiny cultures called start stock cultures and starter cultures, and then you'll put them into a bigger container. And then when that when that bigger container blooms up, you put it into an even bigger container, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and we'll see certain examples. So there's Mikey. And what he's pointed to is an example of a stock culture. So there's a little tiny amount of a tiny amount of algae, and below the stock culture is what we call an intermediate culture. So we talked about sterility, and every single step when you're kind of doing your water change on your algae has to ensure that you don't introduce anything into your cultures that's unfavorable for shellfish. And going back, algae is everywhere. So, you know, even if you have a drop of water in your hair, it can be, float, you know, that little drop or micro drop from your hair that gets into your culture that can kill everything. You have something on your clothes that can get into your culture that can kill everything. It literally comes from everywhere. So it's kind of when you're trying to culture out, you have to take everything into consideration, an open door, an open window. And, you know, it, it kind of makes you kind of rip your hair out when things kind of go wrong because it can just, you know, come from anywhere. Um, but as long as you're careful, you know, I'm making it kind of sound a little bit scarier than it is, but as long as you're careful between everything, um, you should be okay. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's not hard at the same time. And just, I, I just kind of wanted to give a shout out to um, the SPAT members that are, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, growing algae, um, you know, themselves are doing an absolutely fantastic job. And they're taking something that's not so easy and just really, 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 um, you know, running with it and doing amazing. Um, I see there's a couple of questions in the chat. And uh, so excellent question. So the algae not, does not necessarily have a shelf life of 24 to 27 hours. So you will generally do, you know, if you're talking about stock culture transfers, it's a weekly to bi-weekly thing. So you have to allow time for your algae to grow. So going back to the lag phase and we can kind of, let's go backwards a little bit where that lag phase is. So when you first introduce your algae, um, <laughs> this is the fun part of PowerPoint, right? Okay. Um, so this is kind of in, it, the, the, the graph kind of shows, it, it's really sped up. It's not, the realistic aspect of it is your algae is probably not going to come up that quick. Um, so when you first inoculate, it's usually like maybe one to two days, even four days um, for your algae to start to grow. And then it's going to take another three days or so for your algae to get to that peak density. Um, but also, it's also dependent on how fast your algae strains grow. Everything kind of grows a little bit differently. Um, and so, um, when it comes I, th I think that yeah. axis where it says hours should be days, right? I feel like it should be. I don't know why it was. Yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, it should be days. Point, it's not hours, it's days. Yeah. It should yeah. be days there. Yeah, I don't know why it says hours. Yeah, I didn't catch that when I was, when I was putting that together. So my apologies on that. Um, and so um, when you generally inoculate one container, you're not going to put more algae in it. Once you put something into one container, that's it. You don't want to add something else in it because a second addition of something or a second addition of another culture could be a contamination um, vector. Um, so if you notice your cultures are kind of getting a little light as you're harvesting and you kind of take a little sample, you put it underneath a microscope and you see everything is good, then you kind of just add a little bit more fertilizer. Don't harvest your culture for a couple more days. And because the cells are dividing and dividing and dividing, you'll have peak density um, again. But like, you know, like I said, like Kim said, it's all about keeping everything in exponential growth. Once it kind of starts to go, you know, to this point in the graph and starts to die off. And, you know, going back to your question, how do you know when your algae is corrupted? Um, there's a lot of things that happen. Um, it could turn a really weird, sick color. So let's say you have a brown and it turns a really like ugly green. Um, that's a pretty good, you know, indicator that something happened. You have a lot of foam on the top of your culture. That's a good indicator something happened. You have, a, you know, a line of brown gunk that's around, you know, the edges of your tank. You know, that doesn't look like algae. Um, that's a pretty good indicator. So it's not like mm, maybe my algae's bad, maybe my algae's not. When things go wrong, it goes wrong. It goes wrong really quick. 
and you know, and you know when it goes wrong. Sometimes it smells. You know, you walk into your lab and like, oh, mm, that doesn't smell right, and that's usually um, because something died. Um, so it's it's pretty it's pretty obvious when something goes wrong. Hey, hey, Josh, I've got a question for you. Um, so when you're when you're when you're transferring from one vessel to a larger vessel, you know, assume I'm assuming you're not just going by days; you're going by a number of different things like color and and yeah. what. What is the indicator that you know you're ready to sort of expand? Um, so I, I go by color, honestly. Um, so the darker your culture is, um, the more um, you know populated your algae is, and the denser it is. So the more algae or the more population you add to a culture vessel, the better chance you have of everything coming up. And the reason why that is is the algae itself actually changes the chemistry of seawater a little bit in favor of itself. So the more algae you add, the better the entire population is going to be able to intake nutrients. Um, and the better nutrient intake means that they're going to be happier and they're going to divide and divide. Um, so when I go through and when I go through and when I, want, and when I want to decide when I go through like to the next stage, I look at my color. And so, you know, I, the way I kind of describe it, I kind of put it kind of in beer. Where is as my algae is coming up, when I start to kind of notice it look like Guinness or, you know, a Sam Adams, like, you know, a dark Sam Adams, then it's a good indicator to me that, hey, my algae is really populated. I'm still in that logarithmic growth phase because I haven't let it stay dark for multiple days. So I'm trying to catch it right when it's starting to become a Guinness. And that's, you know, I normally don't go more than, you know, right when it reaches that Guinness stage. I normally don't go more than three to five days before I throw it into another vessel. Ideally, if I have the room, I'd rather just get it into the next stage right away. The quicker you can get it into the next stage when it's at an appropriate you know, um, density, the better um, you are. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Cool, my pleasure. And, and also you kind of have to do it, I, I call it eyeballometrically because once you try to sample it, like to get an algal count, you're, you're, you're theoretically going to corrupt your stock. So yeah. it's, it's good to do it by. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was wondering. I was wondering, like, you know, how you can tell without opening it up and, you know, make, making it vulnerable. Yeah. And, and kind of like going through and also kind of trying to decide when you're kind of going to your next stage, you have to look at just, you know, what your flask or carboy is looking like. So let's say I have a flask of algae that I'm looking to put into the intermediate step. If I take it, I swirl it around and the entire thing like looks super, super chunky, mm, not so good. <laughs> so it, 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 again, it's, it, you're kind of eyeballing it and kind of, you know, I, I have, and what, I'm skipping really, really, really far ahead. I have a couple systems that allow me to monitor what my algae is doing. Um, because I have a computer system that allows me to do it, but most cultures is all by eye. And you're just kind of trying to catch it as the color gets, you know, pretty, as it gets dark. Um, you know, I would say the color range that I'm looking for is a really nice deep orange to just black out, um, you know. So, but it depends also to what my need is at the time, how much algae am I looking to bloom at that time, you know, how much animals I have in my hatchery. So all that. And, and keep in mind that what Josh is talking about is for culturing the algae, not for feeding the animals, because then yep. it's a totally different thing. Because yep. then you can count your cells, but yep. this is just for culturing the algae, not for yep. feeding your animals with the algae. Yep. Uh, let's see. All right. So again, kind of going through the steps and keeping kind of sterility. So if you're doing a flask, the flask transfer, you do what's called a sterile transfer. And so what kind of best way to sterilize something is heat. So what Mike is kind of, what Mike is doing there is adding a stock culture um, to a new stock culture. So it's not as simple as, hey, I have my first algae, you know, flasks and I could just leave it and I could be good forever. No. So after you transfer, you know, your flasks over to a larger vessel, you have to ensure that you always have algae that can come up behind it. So in order to do that, you have to do a water change on your algae. And, um, you know, well, we'll get into the further steps. What Mike's doing right there is using a blowtorch to ensure that nothing gets into his flask 
um, while he's transferring. And uh, so to kind of explain it a little bit more detailed is you have a clean flask that's full of sterile salt water. And we'll get to how you sterilize everything in a minute, but you have a clean fast flask full of sterilized salt water with fertilizer already in it. You'll take your flask that has algae in it already and you'll introduce a flame to the neck of the flask. Um, that flame is going to do one of two things. One is going to sterilize the rim of your flask. So if there's any little bacteria stuff on it, it's going to kill that. Two, when you open your flask and you go to pour your algae into a new flask, having the flame around the neck of the flask is going to kind of act like a chimney. And it's going to poof, send a big plume pretty much of warm air um, out of the flask. And if there's anything floating around, it's going to kind of get away from the neck of the flask where you're ensuring that nothing's gonna kind of float in. So it's just kind of, does that make sense? It's kind of, you know, kind of hard to explain without visually showing, but does that make sense to everybody? I'll check the uh, chat if there's a chat. Doesn't look like so. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna assume that it kind of makes sense. Um, and then this is kind of, you know, going from the intermediate stage so let you know we have our stock cultures. Josh, just yeah. just a second. Yeah, um, go, go back one slide. Yeah. So yeah, just to make it clear, you got a flask that has nice dense algae in it. You're pouring a little bit into a of a, a little flask that with just sterile like sterile uh, media, seawater and nutrient into two of them, and then the rest of it into the other one. And what that does is you're never if you were to take that stock flask and just dump it into the big one, you just lost your stock flask and you have no backup. So you're making up a new backup, dating it, going to the next size, but you never lost your, your, your stock. You just, you just duplicated it. It, it, it. It's a little confusing, but if you were to take that little flask and it came up a nice color and you dumped it into the bigger flask, now all of a sudden you don't have any little flask anymore. So you have to make a new little one and put it on the uh, on the uh, shelf there. So you always have a backup. Do you add more medium into the backup? The, the medium is the sterile backup. It, it's been autoclaved. It's sealed. It's never been opened until you do your transfer. You do your transfer quickly of, let's say, 10 milliliters into the little one, another 10 milliliters into the other one. And then the rest of it, or almost all of it, in, if it's got weird things in it, or as much as you want into the big one. And now you've got a big one coming up and your two small ones to replace the one you just used. And, and so you never lose your stock. You can't lose your stock flash. If you lose your stock flash, you gotta start from the beginning again. And that, that makes sense. Take, yeah. That can take a month if you have one cell <laughs> in a little flask. So. Yeah. Good, thanks. Yeah. And to answer kind of the nutrient question is when you're going to the next stage, then, you know, there's going to be a little bit more nutrients in that intermediate phase, in that intermediate stage. So as you're kind of going up in size, there's going to be more nutrient media um, in, uh, you know, in the bigger sizes. So more fertilizer, pretty much. I, I, if you're transferring your plant to, you know, a, big, a bigger pot, you're going to add a little more miracle grow to it. Kind of, you know, kind of, kind of the same deal. Um, so, you know, from there you have the intermediates and then you have then to the carboy. And then the nice thing about the carboy is, you know, it's, it, it can range from five gallons to 10 liters to 15 liters. But, you know, from the carboy, then you can kind of, you have enough population and enough algae that you can pretty much put it wherever you want. If I wanted to, you know, grow a 500 gallon tank of algae, I could take that entire five gallons of algae in there and, pretty much throw it in that 500 gallon tank um, and expect it pretty much to grow. Um, but also that being said, if you're doing um, a large, 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 large tank like that, you kind of fill everything up in steps. So let's say I have, a, I have a 500 gallon tank and I have five gallons of algae. I'm gonna fill my 500 gallon tank, I don't know, quarter of the way. I'm gonna throw my five gallons of algae in there. I'm gonna add you know, some fertilizer in there and then I'm gonna let it bloom up. And then the darker I let it bloom in that, you know, quarter filled tank, I can then pretty much, if it gets really dark, I'll have no worry, no problem filling that 500 gallon tank up all the way, because that'll, that, that will ensure that my algae has enough population in there that it's going to bloom up and, you know, be beautiful, turn a really nice color, 
you want to go swimming in it, maybe you can go swimming in it, but I wouldn't recommend it, especially if you're trying to feed your little shellfish. So, um, so like I said, it's, you know, it's going from a little tank to a bigger tank to a bigger tank to a bigger tank. But, you know, of course, after your flask and everything, you know, are all done and the algae is out of your flask or your, you know, your, your culture crash or something happened, you got to clean everything. So um, this is kind of a funny picture. You can see Mike, you know, with, you know, super, super hip goggles. And the goggles are kind of really necessary because um, you use kind of really nasty chemicals to clean everything, but you want to ensure that, you know, if there's anything alive in your flasks or in your tanks and stuff like that, you want to make sure that it's, uh, it's dead. Um, and, uh, so excellent question. So we're gonna to get to the fertilizer question in a second. Um, so a couple slides ahead. Um, we will get to that, I promise. Um, but kind of going back to um, you know cleaning everything, you use some pretty caustic uh, chemicals. So what Mike's using right there is acid called muriatic acid, is hydrochloric acid, not really nice stuff, but using nasty stuff like that ensures that nothing's really gonna survive. So you use the acid, you neutralize it, and then you know, um, everything will be clean enough for you for you you to use the next round because I don't know it's kind of wasteful if you only use a container you know only once you want to be able to use the same glassware over and over and over, and not for nothing the glassware used to grow algae the flasks are not the cheapest thing in the world so you know. Yep. So there's the glassware. So here's the autoclave. So Kim mentioned an autoclave. So there's a couple ways that you can sterilize what you're trying to grow. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a bunch, a bunch of different ways. And we'll get a little more specific when we go, when we go to the different growing methods. Um, but the autoclave is used for flasks and some carboys. So it uses heat and pressure to kill everything. So you have your seawater that's been filtered. You will throw your nutrient media in there. And the filtration in the media is just not really enough. So you kind of throw it in the autoclave. You'll tighten it up. You'll turn it on. It'll blast it. I believe it's 200, it was like, it's over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And it'll go to pressures up to like 15 to 20 PSI. And you'll do that for an extended period of time. And that just ensures that nothing's going to live. Um, and you kind of want that because you want as clean of an environment as possible to ensure that when you dump your algae into your flask or tank or carboy, only the algae is going to come up. So you have a couple different methods when it comes um, to the Milford method. And Kim kind of briefed on this a little bit. And I'm not going to go super, super insane detail on this because it's, you know, like I said, it's a lot. So, but batch culture, pretty much you have one tank, you're going to drain it out completely, you know, clean your tank, start fresh. You have a semi-continuous culture, which is kind of similar to the batch culture, but instead of um, bat draining it out all the way, you're going to drain everything out part of the way. And then once you, you know, harvest part of the tank, you're going to fill it back up with sterilized seawater that's been probably filtered really well. You'll throw some new fertilizer in there and hopefully if everything goes well, your algae will be bloomed up the next day. Semi-continuous is really great because going back to keeping your algae in logarithmic growth and harvesting that peak, because you're adding a dilution to it, um, you're kind of forcing your algae to kind of go back into logarithmic growth. Um, but there's also, so when it comes to batch and semi-continuous, this is kind of a really good example of that. So if you go into the SPAT lab and the SPAT, root, SPAT algae room, you're going to see all these funky little tubes, right? So besides, you know, looking like a science experiment, maybe you can throw, you know, one of those little dinosaurs. I don't know if anybody remembers that. You throw it in water and they grow kind of, you know, 10, 15 times their size, um, you know. But these are really good ways to grow algae. Simple. Um, all you need is just a clean container, some light, throw some nutrients in there, and you can have, you know, a lot of algae. And this is called, and these are called cobalt tubes. And they either come really small or really big. Um, so, like I said, that's kind of an overview. Um, the light can come from either natural sunlight, artificial, um, the, but the problem with the cobalt tube system is it's very labor intensive. However, if you have a lot of people helping you, um, it's not. So that's the advantages. It's really easy to use relatively. Um, 
it doesn't take up a lot of space. So if you're a tiny hatchery, you can have a bunch of bees in succession with each other and be successful in growing algae. Um, another way people sterilize their seawater is using bleach and then neutralizing the bleach. So, you know, you can fill up your cowl tube full of filtered seawater if you want to take that extra step because it's not like you can stick a cowl tube in an autoclave. Um, to take that extra step, you'll bleach it and then you will um, neutralize the bleach the next day and then add your algae in. Um, it works. I don't love bleaching things, but sometimes it's kind of unavoidable. Um, so what you consider with it, so like I said, it's labor intensive. The tubes can sometimes leak. Um, everything is done manually, which if you have a lot of people doing it, it's not that big of a deal. If it's just you by yourself, it might be a little, little bit, just in, you know, depending on um, how big your system is. And also, they tend to sometimes not be the cleanest things in the world, so contamination can happen really quickly, especially if you're doing it semi-continuously because you need to open up you know, your culture in order to put that back in. And if you kind of notice on the pictures, the tops of them are covered by plastic. They make fiberglass top to them, but you know, they can get a little expensive. And if you're in a pinch, you can just use pinch or it's plastic. Uh, and that does a generally pretty good job. Um, so before I kind of go on, I kind of want to answer also that nutrient question. So the nutrients that um, are generally used um, for algae culture is called F over two, um, specifically Gilliard's F over two. So Kim mentioned Gilliard, who pretty much, you know, started the Milford method. Um, so pretty much named after him. Um, so it's, it's components are your basic phosphorus, nitrogen, there's trace metals, there's certain vitamins that the algae needs in there. Um, you can buy it commercially or you can make it yourself, um, but that's what it's called. It's called F over two. And there's different variations um, on that different recipe. Um, if you're really interested in it, you can do a Google search and uh, you know, search Gilliard's F over two and that formula and the recipe is available online pretty much for anybody to use. And what's kind of cool is if you make your own nutrient, you know, nutrient solution, you can have fun with it. You can mess with a couple of things and see what works and see what doesn't work. And also when you make your own, you can guarantee that everything is sterile. However, I've used both the homemade stuff and the store-bought stuff and they're both fine. Um, the problem with making your own is it's just so time consuming. Um, and that could be almost a job in and of itself. Um, so, but the commercial stuff can be a little bit expensive. So if you have a hatchery, it's kind of, you know, a cost-based analysis sort of deal. Um, for me, I like easy. Sometimes it's just easier just to buy it, especially if you have to make a lot of it. Um, so as Kim mentioned before, um, or we mentioned too, you know, you have continuous culture. So you have batch culture, you have semi-continuous culture, and you have continuous culture. So the name kind of goes, you know, hand in hand. It's you're adding a constant supply of water to your culture while harvesting constantly. So you have water consistently going in, you have potentially nutrient dosing at a very specific point in time, and you have algae always going out. And this is so advantageous when you have a hatchery because, you know, the, not the worst thing, but one of the most labor intensive things of a hatchery is having to feed everybody. And Kim makes fun of me all the time because, you know, before we had everything kind of going, we we're walking around with buckets. And I mean, it's a great workout, you know, like besides fishing, you know, I'm working all the time. So going to the gym is not really the most ideal thing in the world. So, you know, doing bicep, you know, curls with, you know, uh, algae, you know, with buckets of algae is not a bad workout, but it gets really tiresome. So having a system that allows you to continuously harvest algae means that you can continuously pump it after it leaves your vessel wherever you need it. And it's just something that you just don't have to worry about. Um, so there's a bunch of different systems that, you know, that um, are used for continuous culture, just like batch culture. But the most famous and the most, you know, ones that you see around the Cornell campus is called the CCAP system. So it utilizes clear plastic bags with either natural or artificial light to grow your algae. So what I really like about the system is everything uses tubes. So when you're inoculating, when you're, you know, harvesting or everything, you don't have to touch anything. Is pretty much done automatically. So for, with the flip of a switch, I can add my F over two. Um, you know, with opening one line, I can harvest my algae. Um, you know, I can literally put a drain port at the top of the bag, and as the water drips into the bag through this little line right here, I can have algae flowing out of here down this gutter into a bucket whenever I want. And I think my favorite part of this system is 
that I don't have to go and go head first inside a tank to clean it. I can use steam in order to clean this entire system. Um, and the reason why that is, is the system, the water delivery system and nutrient delivery system is all glass or silicone tubing. So it's really, 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 really heat resistant. Um, with that being said, it's glass. I can be very clumsy sometimes. So I've definitely broken my fair share of tubes. Yeah, this is kind of cool because it kind of looks like a scene, you know, coming you know, from Star Wars. You know, I, I think I think Darth Vader is going to, you know, appear out of that row any second. But, you know, it's also kind of cool because you need, you know, a good amount of steam in order to clean the system. But it's a really, really, really effective tool. And because everything is all tube to tube, your algae cultures generally get a lot darker than a cobble tube system and they last a lot longer. And that's so advantageous because if you have a lot of algae all the time, then you can grow a ton of shellfish. Just so nobody gets confused in that picture, uh, all of the algae is not getting steam, just the glassware. So you can shut all the little valves and do your steam and the algae isn't getting what you're seeing there. It yep. can look confusing. It's like, you're steaming your algae? Wow. <laughs> but no, it's just the glassware and everything else is shut off. Yep. My dog wants the attention all the time. <laughs> so, you know, like I, you know, like I said, like Kim said too, you know, the maintenance it is a lot less than a cobble tube system. So this is great because once you set it up, it, it really, the, the entire maintenance is really only a couple hours a week. So you can, you don't have to worry about your algae all the time like you would maybe with, you know, a more simpler system. It's kind of a give and take. Um, but kind of the biggest problem when it comes to the CCAP system specifically is it needs a lot of space. So if you don't have, you know, a large, you know, footprint to kind of work with, then you could be limited in your CCAP system. But they make different sizes. You could have six bags, you could have 10 bags. The system that I have is 40 bags. Um, so it, it creates a pretty, pretty big footprint. Um, again, glass, everything is glass. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I be clumsy sometimes. So, you know, stuff, you know, has a chance to break and the glass isn't always the cheapest thing in the world. And of course, you need a way to steam your system. I use a pressure cooker that's, you know, used pretty much to, you know, fry a turkey in. Um, but, you know, we have another 20 bag system in um, the hatchery inside the Cornell building that uses like a little uh, hot plate. Um, so it can vary. Um, so algae growing systems can range from really simple to really complex. So, um, we have two hatcheries, well, I guess technically three for counting the spat on the Cornell campus. So I'm the manager for the large hatchery um, that's, you know, that, that, that's here. And um, because we have to produce an astronomical amount of shellfish, we have a bunch of different algae growing systems that allow us to do so. So going on the more complex aspect of it, these are, we have four of these bioreactors. So these are really cool because, you know, they look really pretty. Um, but they allow me to control every single aspect of my algae culture. Um, and what's kind of really cool is everything is automatic. So I have a computer system that automatically doses nutrients. I can track my cell density and how everything's growing in real time. I can even, I even have an app on my cell phone that I can look at my computer whenever I want, which is a good thing or a bad thing at the same time. Um, but again, my kind of favorite thing about these machines is cleaning is literally just a push of a button. I add, I, you know, if a culture crashes in a bioreactors, which it happens, um, all I have to do is just drain it out. I add my cleaning agents and I press a button and the thing just cycles and looks like a washing machine and it cleans itself. So in terms of growing, you know, it, it's awesome. However, the practicality, if you're, you know, a hatchery looking for, you know, an algae system to use, that bioreactors are great and they're a great supplemental system. However, the disadvantage of them, you can only grow one strain of algae in them and they're not cheap. One of them costs around $60,000 and that's a lot of money just for one strain of algae. But with that being said, I can get cell densities that are so dense, I can put them in a, you know, a clear cup and it looks like a cup of coffee, which you know, the more dense, the denser your algae is, the more high quality shellfish food it is. Um, and what's kind of also really neat about them is, you know, with how advanced they are, you kind of see all these little cones 
So one of the biggest limitations when it comes to the other systems I showed you guys is light availability. So as your culture grows and it gets really dark, the very center of your algae might be, you know, completely void of light because it's so thick. These cones allow the LED lights that are on these um, reactors to penetrate throughout the entire culture. And that's kind of why everything can get as dark as they, um, as they do. Um, so as you know, the technology is developing further and further, there are even more and more complex systems that are being developed, which is really exciting. And, you know, as Kim mentioned last week, you know, when it comes to, you know, algae culture and bivalve culture and everything, no one's really focusing on food. When it comes to algae culture, people are looking at it for research and biofuel. So these are really advantageous to have, especially, you know, at Cornell for also research purposes, because we can grow a wide variety, you know, of algae strains at super, super high density. So if we want to do the research, we have the capacity to do so. Um, and with also that being said, and we can work it out, you know, Kim with you, if anybody wants to see, you know, the hatchery in action, I don't see any problem with having, you know, we can set up controlled times and controlled groups. If anybody wants to see these in person, I'd be more than happy to show and we can, you know, set a schedule up um, just because I would love to have a million people in there, but because we have to keep the hatchery kind of clean, um, you know, I can't have a lot, a lot, a lot of people in at the same time. But if we do kind of, you know, controlled visits to anybody who wants to see this um, any further, I don't see a problem with it. Um, but, you know, we could figure that out. We could figure a schedule out. But these things are really cool to see in person. The picture only does it, you know, so much justice. Um, so there's, like I said, there's a lot of other complicated systems that are available. And there's another bag system that another hatchery um, down island has. And the website um, for this bag system has a really cool time-lapse video of algae coming up from inoculation to getting really, really dense. And, I thought it'd be pretty cool to show everybody. So I'm gonna click this. I'm gonna try to see. I think I'm gonna have to reshare this. So yeah, you gotta go out and then go back in. Yeah. So we're gonna do that. Can everybody see my internet browser? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Excellent. I'm gonna make this full screen. And so this is, I think a company is called Pure Biomass. So we saw the CCAP system. This is just a variation on a bag system. Um, and so it, it looks really cool. We don't have this, but this video is just awesome. So you see the algae is bubbling, the water is super clear. And now, um, you know, they just, they just added the algae in. I don't know how long this is, but you can kind of see the algae as it spreads, it's just getting darker and darker and darker and darker. So you can kind of see how it kind of starts off like a Bud Light, and then at the very end of it, kind of looks almost like a dentist. <laughs> you know what's funny, Josh, when you put that up, I thought that was like a 10-story building. Thought, <laughs> <laughs> you had a guy walking back like Godzilla. I really was like, oh my God, it's a huge building. What's, what's kind of even crazier is that, that you know, I guess that's, so that one's around 1,350 liters. And you know my bioreactor is roughly 1,250 liters, so they're roughly, uh, you know, roughly the same size. Where this company has, um, oh, uh, has, I don't know that. What is that? Oh, I guess it's another video. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna mute myself for a second. Hey, thanks for coming out to see Josh's video. If everyone's still there, uh, I'll entertain you while he's muted. Um, okay, I think we got that back. That was, I guess, the next I was video. Telling you to do jokes behind your back. <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah, so I mean, so to answer that kind of question, so I get excited about algae and shellfish no matter what. Um, so when I kind of look, you know, into a, um, a microscope and, you know, the different algae that I grow, my favorite algae culture that I like to look at is my green one called Tetrasalmus. And the reason why, so, you know, I mentioned baby food and adult food. So Tetra is a really, really, really pretty, 
you know, green algae I have, but it's also the largest algae cell that I have. So when I look at it underneath the microscope and I had a video and I tried getting the video in here, but um, unfortunately it kept on uh, being really, really, really grainy. Um, so unfortunately it wasn't good, but you know, they zoom around like little whirly gig bugs on a pond. So when I mentioned, you know, algae, they move, they, they move, they have the potential to move really, 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 really fast. And I guess I didn't get into it before, but the movement, you know, has a purpose. They're not moving just because they want to dance and move and groove. The movement pretty much has two functions. One, if there's a predator, they could potentially move away from said microscopic predator. But the other reason why certain cells are moving is to overcome nutrient limitations. So, you know, when it comes to like thinking of these cells, them in water, because they're so tiny, the water is so viscous and this is so like thick. So it's kind of the equivalent of us trying to swim through honey. So if I'm an algae cell and I'm standing still and I can't move, then I'm not able to access any of the nutrients that are around me and I will starve. So I need to move around in order um, to access all of my nutrients. The other thing too, is there's also algae cells that don't move. Um, and I have a couple of strains of algae in my hatchery that are called diatoms. And diatoms are really interesting because they're encased um, in a shell, in a silicate shell. And what's even more interesting about that is the shell is really technically made out of opal, which is a form of silica. So it's a cell within a glass shell. And kind of what those cells kind of rely on in order to overcome nutrient limitations, especially if they're found in nature, is water current. So they kind of rely on bubbles or water or, you know, pump flow in order to get them um, to move and groove. Um, so let's see, I have another chat thing. Yeah, we could totally have a session where we can look at them underneath the microscope. I, I, wonder, I wonder if there's a way, I have a TV that's in um, my hatchery. I wonder if there's a way that we hook the microscope directly up to either my computer and broadcast it that way. We could figure that out. Um, but yeah, we could totally, but we, what we could even do too is with this fat algae lab, we have- We have a camera hooked up in yeah. there. Too, so we, we could just take a sample into there yep. and watch it under the TV. Yep, yep. So yeah, no, we can, we, can, we, can, we can definitely do that. And they're really, really interesting, really cool to look at, um, you know, and we can definitely do, you know, a day or something where we can look at the different sizes because it's pretty amazing to look at the difference between an ISO culture and a Tetra sandwich culture. It's, you know, the Tetra is literally 10 times the size of the ISO cell. It's really rather amazing. Um, so let's see. So Kim kind of branched on this last week. So um, in terms of feeding shellfish and shellfish larvae, live food is kind of king when it comes to it. Um, there are backups. And as Kim kind of mentioned, if you're trying to grow larvae, the backups don't really work. Um, I've used algae paste um, at my last job in the last hatchery I was at, but we only used it as a supplement for the larger animals. So it worked well for larvae, you know, larvae after they developed. Um, and we had post-set animals or animals that under, underwent metamorphosis and start to look more like a clam and oyster, we all know. And it worked well for larger animals, but for the larvae, they really, really, really want that live stuff. Um, another really cool thing too, kind of just mentioned auger is, um, Kim mentioned, I believe in the lecture last week about carrageenan and, and auger and everything. So. Let's say you're a hatchery and you don't kind of want to keep all of your stock cultures or something happens to your stock cultures in order to have a backup for your backup for your backup. You can actually, almost like you're plating a bacteria culture, plate your algae cells on auger and keep them alive, you know, pretty much, you know, indefinitely. You just have to change your auger out once or twice a year. So if something happens to your stock cultures and you have um, algae that's been plated in on auger in your fridge, you can just take a sample that you know you plated, put it you know in some nutrient media, and it should come up absolutely beautiful. So it's just having a backup for your backup for your backup because if you don't have your stock cultures, then you can't have a hatchery and you can't have shellfish. Um, so, and I believe that's it. Um, so the one thing I kind of wanted to highlight, 
and um, everything. So just kind of mentioning going back to the whole dietary thing when it comes to, you know, having the most optimal diet in the shellfish. This oyster right here has been in our hatchery feeding on microalgae for a month. That's just one month of growth. And looking at it today, it's like, you know, that was here, it's now up to here. So if you had enough algae to feed your adult oysters in the hatchery, you know, indefinitely, I'm more than convinced you can get an oyster um, to plate within six to eight months. However, it might not taste as delicious because the taste of your oyster is also going to depend on the algae community it's feeding on. So does anybody have any questions on, uh, on anything? I think, uh, I think I talked to everybody's ear enough, right, on algae. I think we did just about a little bit over an hour. So I hope everybody is not terribly burnt out about this. I could talk about this for hours upon hours upon hours, but I don't want to bore everybody with it. So, <laughs> so let's Thanks, see. Josh. Yeah, that was great. Cool. Thank you. I know, I great lecture. Like, Thanks. My great info. Small from Puerto Rico, so I'm going to go. And no problem. Thank you, Kip. Have a good Excellent. weekend. Excellent. Have okay. a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. So, just also, too, if anybody has any further questions or want to, you know, chat with me more. Um, you can feel free to email me whenever you want. Um, my email is jp2452 at cornell.edu. I'm going to... There you go. I just sent yeah, it There you go. Out. Thanks, Darcy. Perfect. You're welcome. Like I said, this is my first Zoom, you know, lecture like this. So, oh, I guess I turned on subtitles. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so... Excellent. That being said, thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming and everybody who's watching on YouTube. Thank you, thank you. And if you see me on campus and want to chat, feel free to say hi, um, more than approachable. So thank you guys. All right, thanks, Josh. I'll talk thanks. to you. Yeah. Uh, talk to you next week. Have a good weekend. Thank you, you too. All right, I'm going to end this, guys. Have a great weekend. <laughs>